Well, hey, before we get into the word this morning, I get to do one of my favorite things as a pastor. Two of my favorite things, wedding, and then my second favorite thing is getting to dedicate a baby of a couple that I got to marry. So I'm going to ask Brandon and Ashley to come out. Oh, gosh. You're not going to cry. Are you going to? Don't cry when you see me. And uh, what I love is this morning, I'm like, I, I texted Brandon just a few minutes ago, and I'm like, hey, you guys can come up through the back. And he said, oh, well, we will do that when we're done doing the lyrics and the cameras. And um, a couple that serves the Lord together, they say a couple that prays together stays together. And I believe that is the same for a couple that serves the Lord together. And these two have been um, an amazing young couple to watch serving Jesus together. And now you guys are serving the Lord through raising little Isabella, which is awesome. Hey, hi. Good morning. Okay. All right. Hey, can I hold you? Would that be okay? Okay. Hey, that's okay. So we get to pray for little Isabella, but we get to pray for Brandon and Ashley this morning. Hey, which is, don't, if you get scared, I'll hand you back. Don't worry. See? And uh, this is an awesome opportunity as a church because we get to come alongside this family. All right, here. You want to you wanna, wanna go to daddy? It's okay. It's okay. It'll st- the prayer will still work. It'll still work. Yeah. And we get to come along these, aside these two and support them in their walk in the Lord, but as a family, it is difficult being parents, especially today in, in our world. Being a parent is not an easy thing to navigate through all that is out there. And uh, these two, as you see them at church, now you can say, hey, I'm praying for you. Uh, hey, I've been there. Uh, you've experienced the same things if you're a parent. You know what they're going through, and, you, and we can come alongside each other as the body of Christ. But we also, as dedicating Isabella to the Lord, our prayer this morning is going to be that she would grow up loving Jesus, following after Jesus, and being used by him in a mighty way in this world to be a light for him. So it is an honor to get to pray with you guys and get to pray for Isabella. And would you guys stand with me as we pray? Hey. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you that you brought these two together, Lord, and this is a work that you have done, Jesus. And, and now to see them with this beautiful baby girl. And Lord, I thank you for the love they have for you. That is first and foremost. And I thank you, Lord, for the love that they have for each other and for now their daughter, Lord. And we pray for this family. We pray Lord, that you would continue to put your hedge of protection around them, that you would continue, Lord, to lead and guide them as they follow after you, Lord. May you just be faithful to to, uh, remind them each and every day, Lord, that you've got them, that you're there for them. And Lord, we want to lift up little Isabella to you this morning, and we want to pray, Lord, that you would fill her right now just with your love and that you would use her, Lord, as she grows up to be a light in this dark world that, Lord, you would uh, go before her and prepare the way for her. We know that you have a plan for her life, and we ask that she would seek that and follow after that, Lord, that she would want your will for her life, Jesus. And, and Lord, if you should tarry and to the point where she is um, ready to marry herself, we even pray for her husband today, Lord, that he would be a man that pursues you and a man that stands for you. And Lord, we just again want to lift this family up to you and little Isabella up to you. And we want to pray that Jesus, uh, you would use them in this time to be hope, truth, and love, Jesus. And we thank you for this little life. We thank you for what a blessing she is. And may you continue to allow her to be a blessing to every person she comes in contact with. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can you say amen? Yeah. All right. All right. All right. You want to teach? Yep. You can teach. Okay. Yes. Awesome. All right. Well, if you're still standing, you can be seated. Woo. 
Deuteronomy chapter 17, if you want to make your way there. And if you need a Bible this morning, please raise your hand, and we would love to bring you a Bible. Isn't the gift of life an awesome thing? Awesome thing. Three people clapped. I love that. I love it. Wow, you guys are on, on point this morning. It's going to be a rough crowd this morning. Um, I love just, again, and we're going to, it's kind of cool. We'll see this in the text this morning. But God's plan for our lives is perfect. And it, it's, it's so sad that we can spend a big majority of our lives running away from that plan and even at times fighting against it. And, and I love that he sees 20 years, 40 years, 60 years out. I love that he saw that Brandon and Ashley would come together and be married. And I love that he saw that they would have this little baby. And, um, and I just want to challenge and encourage you this morning. Do not run from God's plan. Do not run for what, from what he has for you. Because what he has for you is going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. And his will is perfect. Amen. And we're going to actually see kind of that this morning in the text as we get back into Deuteronomy. And I just want to say this before we get into the text. Uh, what an awesome Sunday it was. Yes, last week as we celebrated Easter together. And uh, awesome seeing people come to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And, uh, and I want to encourage you, if you brought someone last week and uh, just continue to pursue them. If they're not here with you today, continue to uh, call them, check in with them, pray for them. And, uh, and, and I know this as a pastor too, it's, it's one of those things that we roll with when you have Easter services and then you have Christmas Eve services. Usually they are full and then the next week you're like, oh, where did where everybody go? And there are a lot of people that just want to make sure. Has, some people came last week looking just to see, has Jesus come back yet? Okay, he didn't. Church is still here. I'm okay. I can still I can still live out there, and I'll eventually make that decision. And and uh, I I think now more than ever we need to be. It's urgent. It is urgent that we need to be out there telling people that Jesus loves them and that they need to surrender to the plan that He has for them. So, Deuteronomy 17, we're going to pick up here, and we're going to see uh, as we start to pick up pace through this uh, th- through this book, we're going to see Moses again. Uh, preparing Israel, we know this, getting them ready to enter the promised land, but something very important for us to also be reminded of is that we are going to see the passing of Moses in this book. And, and Moses, uh, being a young chap, obviously knows this, that it's coming to a point where he is not going to always be there with Israel. And, and he's preparing them, and God is giving Moses instructions to give to Israel. And and you need to remember what Moses is giving them is from the Lord. It's God's God's plan for Israel, God's desire for Israel. And, And Moses, even in the text this morning, reminds Israel that when he was at Mount Sinai receiving the commandments and the Lord was had descended upon that mountain and was talking with Moses, the people at that point in fear said, this is a good thing that you're talking to God. Because if we were in his presence, we would, we would die. As they saw the glory of God, they were, they were fearful, thinking, how could we ever approach? And, and, and we like this. And they even kind of told Moses, we like this arrangement. You can give us the, the word from the Lord and what's going on and what we need to do. And, and we won't die because of his glory being in his presence. And, and here's what's amazing today. Because of Jesus Christ, because of what we celebrated last Sunday... You and I can be in the presence of God. Isn't that amazing? We will be in the presence of God. And, and, and we can go in, Hebrews tells us, into the throne room with boldness. That's not with, and we got to be careful with that word. That doesn't mean we rashly just charge in and bark orders at God. That means we can go in with confidence in knowing that what Jesus did on our behalf was real and it worked and we are covered by his blood. And now we can go into the presence and be before God. We can be in relationship with God again because of what Jesus has done. 
So Moses, again, this mouthpiece for God, speaking to Israel, getting them ready. And, he's, and again, it, it's, it's important, as we see, for Moses to also, as they've been dependent upon God, but also at times they were more probably dependent on Moses, which, which Moses, I think, did a good job at, at reminding the people, hey, I'm not your God. And we, we need to be very good at that as well, that we don't create environments within the body of Christ where people become dependent upon us, but we point them to the Lord, dependency upon their Savior. But Moses is getting them ready. He's, he's letting them know what the, what the climate will be like, what they'll have to do, endure, how they're going to worship the Lord when they're in the promised land. But he's also getting them ready. He's gonna, we're going to see he's going to set them up for what the structure will look like and what it will be like when he's not around. They're going to have something in place, and God is going to lay it out for them here. And in 17, the first verse of chapter 17 starts out with, a, um, <clears throat> again, a you shall not. Now, this is all throughout the law, you shall and you shall not. And, uh, and, and when we read the words you shall not, I don't know about you, but maybe... Maybe, like me at times, the flesh side of me can kick in and say, oh, great, another rule. Another thing I'm not allowed to do. Another thing I, 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 I don't have freedom in. And, and I will tell you, if you're searching for freedom, and, and if you think for some reason that there is no freedom in God, you are, you are gravely mistaken. There is freedom today in Christ Jesus. See, the world makes us think, well, you know, if we have a relationship with God and we, we live for God, then we have no more freedom. We, we are then put in this confinement and this box of, of us and God, and no longer are we allowed to do what we want to do. No longer are we allowed to. And, and that is a complete lie from the enemy. There is more freedom in Christ than there ever could be offered in this world. And the world thinks, oh, because you're allowed to do this and that, you have freedom. The very things that will ultimately destroy us, we think, is freedom. And, and, and these you shall nots are, as it was for Israel, very crucial for them to follow all of the law and to listen to these words, you shall not, and to listen to the words, you shall. It's just as crucial for you and I today to ensure that we are following the you shall nots. When God says, this is what I desire of you, this is the life I have for you, this is, this, these are the rules I put in place, we should heed them because in them, again, is life. And all of these things, again, we know that God put in place to keep Israel safe, to keep him in relationship with him, to keep them away from the pagan worship that was all around them, the evilness that was all around them. And, and this, this morning, he's going to, his, you shall not, is going to be, we're going to see, in relationship to how they approach him, again, in worship, but more in, specifically in sacrifice unto the Lord. And look what it says, you shall not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or a sheep in which is a blemish, any defect, whatever, for that is an abomination to the Lord your God. So right off the bat here, they're being brought back to sacrifice. They're being instructed that and reminded that what you bring unto the Lord for your sacrifice, whether it be, I love that he's very specific, whether it be an ox or sheep, he, he is reminding them that this is God's desire. Whatever you bring to him that is to be a sacrifice should be without blemish or any defect. And plainly it says that it is an abomination to the Lord. Now, we would ask, well, why, why is God so particular in what is brought to him as a sacrifice? Well, this reminds us again that God is holy. Our God is holy, amen? We have a holy and pure and righteous God. And in our sacrifice, or in Israel's coming unto the Lord and sacrificing unto the Lord, his desire was to remind them that you are approaching a holy God, and what you present unto me is to be perfect, without blemish, the very best. And a sacrifice ultimately should cost something. 
And, and he wants them to be reminded that, listen, when you go forward into this land and you're sacrificing on the Lord, don't cut corners with God. Don't start to think, well, hey, you know what? I've got this. Uh, well, I'm not sure if it is a sheep or if it is. I don't know what it is. But and yeah, it's missing one ear and it's kind of crazy and barks, but it's a sheep. I'm not sure. And I guess I could take this. I got it for free from the pound. I could take that to my, you know, when I go to present this unto the Lord. And, and, and the reminder here is that it should be without defect, without blemish. It should be perfect because our God is perfect. And he is, he is the only one that truly deserves the very best. And here's the reality. As we go through this this morning, I think this is going to be a good challenge for all of us because there are people in our lives that we don't have even we don't even have relationship with but we have put them in these places of of superiority and high places in our lives and we maybe would give our best for them and we would do all we could to impress them to gain their respect to even maybe gain their friendship or even gain their notoriety or even get them to say yeah I see you Yet we will give sometimes the, our poorest to the Lord. We will go and say, oh, I'm going to do this for this person. But what are we doing for the Lord? What are we presenting unto the Lord? So this is crucial for you and I today to be reminded of, of what are we presenting unto the Lord. Now, this is all changed because you and I today, we are now living sacrifices. And as we go through the Old Testament, we're reminded of of the law and the sacrificial system that was put in place, I think it is always a good opportunity to stop and say, thank you, Lord, that no longer are we under the law and no longer are we under the sacrificial system. Would you all agree? Think about if we had to be under the sacrificial system this morning. And when you came to church, you had to go and find that sheep. You had to find that ox. You had to bring it. And the, the priests were outside waiting for you. And they would go through the whole process. And, and all of these things, again, were a foreshadowing of Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice. But all of that was entailed. And Jesus took care of all of that. Once and for all, our high priest also was the sacrifice. And he was perfect without blemish. And no longer are we under this, which is so awesome. He's fulfilled all of it. Yet as we look at all of this, we, we can see Jesus in all of it. But today, again, as we started this study, it's pretty amazing to, to, to know this, that today, right now in Israel, things are moving very quickly to restore all of these things. Things are moving very quickly right now and very close to the point where the temple can be rebuilt again. It's very close. You and I might even see that in our day. We might see the, the, the negotiation and treaties that need to happen in order for the temple to be built and for, it to, and for construction to start, we may actually see that unfold in our very day. We might see that go, all these things getting ready for it. They have been preparing. They have, guess what? We've talked about this. They have the red heifers already in Israel, ready to go. And guess what? They've been selected. They are without blemish. They are, in, 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 as far as the law, they are perfect because they were bred and raised in Texas. I mean, they actually were. They were raised in Texas, kind of crazy, and now they're in Israel. And you may say, this guy's crazy. What is he talking about? Red, what is a red heifer? What is this place? What am, where am I here? This is all real stuff. You can look it up, believe whatever you read online. I'm telling you, it's all true. No. Um, so th- these are all things that are in the works. Jesus came and fulfilled all of it. All of it. And today there are still many that are saying we're waiting for the Messiah to come and to fill the temple. We're going to institute all these things again. They've got the priests lined up. They've got everything ready to go. They have the funding. They believe they know where the Ark of the Covenant is. They believe, and Indiana Jones has nothing to do with it. They literally believe they have found where it's at. 
and, and they are very close to saying, what do we need to do to build our temple? And then we know this, that there will be one who will most likely broker that deal of peace in order for a temple to be built, who will then go in and become the abomination of desolation, who will go into that temple and will declare, now you will worship me. You'll worship my system that I've put in place. So you shall not is a very important thing, not something to run from. Again, his plans we shouldn't run from, his will we should, we, we should be in the center of, and his you shalls we should be doing, and his you shall nots we shall be adhering to because they are life-giving and there is freedom in them. Now, here's the thing. Culture today has dictated a lot of things that, that are taking place within the church, which is sad to see. And when we start to take the word of God and we start to meal piece it and we take things out and we say, well, this isn't really what it was talking about. We're not going to read that anymore. We're not going to go through that part of the Bible anymore. We're not going to study this. We're going to only go over here. When we start to cater the word of God to our preferences, our likes, to culture, to maybe what we're into, we start to do that. And what happens is we then take away the holiness of our God. He is holy. And when we start to say, well, you know what, the, 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 the sin is something we, we just, you know, so many people are caught up in sin and there's certain sins. Now I hear churches teaching that there's certain sins that people can't get out of. So we got to let them live within those sins in the church because it's just too difficult for them to get out of those sins. Really? Pretty sure what happened, what we, again, it didn't happen last Sunday, but it did happen. We celebrated last Sunday. What happened when Jesus was nailed to the cross and when he said it was finished, meant that all of mankind's sins, payment was paid in full for all of mankind's sins. He didn't say, well, listen, my blood is good enough for this, 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 and the fine print down here will tell you that it didn't cover this or this or this. His blood covers a multitude of sins. Amen? I'm going to keep saying amen just to keep you guys awake, all right? Covers a multitude of sins, but when we start to take away God's word, when we start to say, let's allow this in, when we start to say that God, the blood of Jesus can't forgive that or people can't get out of that, we, we are catering to the culture of this world and we are then slowly chipping away at the holiness of God. And then as we approach him, we approach him thinking, well, he's like one of us. He's just like me. I heard somebody last week on, on Easter Sunday and they're not a pastor, so, but it doesn't give them an excuse. But, I, you know, first they're trying to be, you know, do the religious Christian thing and say he is risen. And, and, and there's so many things today that are being said that are so far from God's word. And he said the same exact things Jesus did, you and I can do. We can do everything he did. No, I don't think so. I don't, I've tried the walking on water thing. I seem to sink every time, and, and it might be just because I'm bigger, but I've tra- I can't go to a cross for people's sins. I can't raise from, I, I can't do that. I wasn't there in the beginning of creation. I can do everything he did? No. No, now the word of God tells us the same power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in us, but that doesn't mean that I can go and do everything that Jesus did. I'm not Jesus. And, and I want to say, you should all right then say, thank you, Lord, that he is not Jesus. We can, and, and as we start to chip away at the you shall nots, as we start to chip away at God's word and say, let's, let's erase that, let's take that away, let's say this is what it really meant, we again are taking away the holiness of God. And I love that this reminder to Israel is a reminder for us today that what we present unto the Lord should be our best. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I love that. That is, that is telling us that whatever we do in our daily lives, we should look at it as an opportunity to bring God glory. How am I bringing God glory today? How am I bringing God glory in the workplace? How am I bringing God glory in my conversations? How am I bringing God glory in what I'm looking at? How am I bringing God glory in what I'm texting? How am I bringing God glory in what I'm posting? I want to challenge you, church. 
If you find yourself on Facebook many hours out of the day and you're scrolling through and getting into debates and conversations with people, I'm not saying it's wrong, but be reminded, how are you bringing God glory in what you post and what you comment? How are we bringing him glory in all areas of our lives? Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Again, whatever we do. I love that because I think we forget of what, and what, just as Israel, we know this, as we started Deuteronomy, we looked at this fact that Israel was set apart and would be used to show all the other nations around them of who their God was. Now we have been set apart and we are to be used to show every person that's around us who our God is. And that, that means when we're in the workplace, we have an opportunity to show people what our, who our God is, what he looks like. When we're, uh, maybe you're in a, a sports league, when we're at practice, whatever it may be, wherever we're at, we have an opportunity to show people who our God is, what he looks like, how he loves. I love, we're reminded, whatever we do, our work heartily, if we're, if we're going and we're, we're in landscaping and we're going to go and we're going to form a wall and we're going to pour concrete and we're going to, uh, you know, plant trees and shrubs and design someone's backyard or design a, a landscape at a hotel where we do it unto the Lord. And we say, I want to bring God glory in what I do. I want people to see God. I, wh- whatever we do, we do it as unto the Lord. And I love this, not for men. Not for men. So I want to encourage you, if you are in the workplace and you struggle with those who are over you, here's a good way to glorify the, the Lord in your workplace. If you struggle, because there are people that we struggle with. That's a given. It's called life. We struggle with people. There might be people you're like, I can't stand this person. They're so rude and disrespectful. Change your mindset when you go to work and say, I'm not going to do it under them. I'm going to do it under the Lord. I'm going to do it under the Lord. And God will do some amazing things through you in your workplace. King David said these words in 2 Samuel 24, 24. He said, but the king said to Aruna, no, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David brought, or bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. This is King David, and, and here is this guy is saying, take it. No, you're the king. Have it. Here's the space. Here's the ox. It's yours. And, and King David's response is, I'm not going to give anything unto the Lord that didn't cost me something. I want it to be, he's going back and saying, I want it to be something that's perfect to present unto the Lord. And here's, again, the reality. It will cost us something to worship Jesus. Especially in our day and age today, it's going to cost us more and more to worship Jesus. And that is reality. That is reality. And, it, and if you're going to go to a church that's going to tell you if you follow Jesus, it's going to be smooth sailing. It's going to be awesome. Everyone's going to love you. Everyone's going to, to be friends with you. Everyone's going to want to hear what you had to say, what you heard at church. Everybody's going to want to hear you worship at, at work. Everybody's going to, that is, that is a false teaching. Now, when you follow Jesus, your life is going to be made whole because you have now an abundant living life from him. You're going to have his peace. You're going to go through storms and know I can get through this because he is with me. But it will cost us sometimes relationships. It'll cost us sometimes family members. It'll cost us comfort. Following Jesus can be difficult. Again, Following a God who is holy, who has rules that are contrary to the rules of this world, can cost us something. But you know what? That's okay. Because it cost him everything. Think about this reality. Because of what Jesus did, here in 17, chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, Israel is being reminded that they should not uh, sacrifice anything to the Lord, uh, whether it be an ox or sheep that has blemish or defect. Think about now because of what Jesus has done. 
Think about this. I have so many defects and blemishes. Yet because of Jesus, I can go before the Lord. But I should not be able to go before the Lord. I should not be able to go before God because I have blemishes and defects. And not only are they defects and blemishes that that you can see right there from where you're sitting or I can see when I look in the mirror, but there's blemishes and defects within my heart, within my soul. And Jesus, because of what he has done, says, now you are clean. Now you can have your relationship restored with your father. It's pretty amazing. It cost him everything, though. And we will say, ah, I don't know if I really want to go to church this way. I don't know if I really want to get into the word this week. I really don't know if I want to. I'll, I'll, I'll pull back a little bit and maybe not let them know that I'm a believer. It cost him everything to say it is finished. It is finished. Let's look at this a little bit more. Chapter 4, if you would, Genesis, if you turn with me to chapter 4 of Genesis. We're going to actually see in chapter 4 of Genesis, this is the first place we see worship acted out in Scripture. And even more particularly, we see sacrifice and offering here in chapter 4 of Genesis. And some of you already know what we're going to look at here, which is good. Uh, But I think it's important to see what can happen within our own hearts. And we're going to see that in Cain and Abel as far as what they brought unto the Lord. And it's important to know this. They, they, they at this point, Cain and Abel, we're going, to, we're going to see, are bringing offerings unto the Lord in chapter 4 of Genesis. And we don't see this in the narrative. We don't see this in the text. So there, there had to be a moment where God gave instruction for them on what it was to worship, but also what it was to bring an offering or sacrifice. And in fact, it's pretty awesome. In chapter 3, we know this, that when Adam and Eve fell into sin and they found themselves ashamed and afraid and knew they were naked, do you guys remember one of the first things that God did for them? He clothed them. In skins, animal skins. And we know in order to clothe someone in animal skins, if anybody here has hunted an animal before, what do you have to do to that animal? You have to kill that animal. Somebody, (gasps) they just talked about killing an animal. No, they had to God sacrifice the first animal to cover Adam and Eve in chapter 3 of Genesis. And then in chapter 4, we see... Cain and Abel coming unto the Lord to present these offerings unto the Lord. So they knew, maybe through what Jesus did in that moment for their parents, but there had been something laid down and communicated from the Lord as far as what he wanted and how he desired to be worshipped. Look at chapter 4 of Genesis, verse 1. It says this, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain, a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain, a worker of the ground, uh, or sorry, in the course of time, Cain, verse three, brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of uh, the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, verse 6, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So Cain and Abel here, bring these offerings unto the Lord. And we see the the distinction here between what these two brothers do. We know that Cain is a farmer, a tiller of the ground, farmer of the ground. We know that Abel is a shepherd. He's raising uh, sheep and goats. And and one brings fruit and and things from the ground. And one brings something that has been sacrificed along with 
Abel brought not only what was for a sacrifice, but also brought the fatty portions along with it. And the Lord looks and he has regard for Abel's offering and he looks at Cain's and does not have regard for Cain's. And Cain immediately is, is upset. So upset that it's physically visible. The Lord looks at him and says, why is your face fallen? What, what, what's the deal? And God communicates to Cain here and says, listen, and gives him this warning. Sin is waiting for you but you'll have to rule over it. You know what that tells me? That tells me that sin can be conquered by Jesus. Amen? God didn't say, there's sin so big, Cain, that you're just going to have to submit to it and relent and, and give in to it and let it take its course in your life. You're just going to have to surrender to it. And I've heard this teaching in the church before where you go to Romans and people will teach that we wear sin suits and we have to sin. It's just our nature. We have to, have to, have to sin. We can't ever stop sinning. And we will fall. We will sin. We are, we are broken. But we do not wear sin suits. We do not go around saying, I continue to live in sin. And here God said, it's laying at the door. It's going to, it's coming after you. But you need to overtake it. You need to Say no. And we know this, that his anger progressed to the point where he kills his brother, murders him. The first murder is in chapter 4 in the Bible. And the first, isn't it crazy, the first public display of worship and then murder is seen in chapter 4 of Genesis. So we look at this and we, we can have some questions. Well, wait a second. If Deuteronomy 17 tells us our, our offering unto the Lord or sacrifice unto the Lord is to be without blemish and defect, here Cain and Abel go to worship the Lord. They both bring these offerings. Why was Cain's not accepted and why was Abel's accepted? And there can be various, you know, conclusions. One, I think it's very important to remember this. God looks at what? Do you know what he looks at? The heart. He looks at the heart. I love that about our God. He does not look at the outward. He doesn't look and say, uh, you know, I don't like the way you look. I don't like the way you smell. I don't like the way you dress. I don't like that. He doesn't look at the outward as many of us do. He looks at the inward and looks at the heart. And that's what he judges off of is the heart. Something in Cain's heart obviously was not right at the start of him gathering his offering to the Lord and bringing it to the Lord. And here's why I would say that. How quickly he finds himself angry to the point of murder. I would say it's safe to say Cain's heart was not in the right place to begin with. If uh, uh, this little mishap of, he could have said, Lord, I am, I am so sorry. You are right. Let me, let me, and here's maybe, maybe, this is just a thought I had. Maybe he knew he should have brought a sacrifice. But maybe, this is just a thought that's not biblical. It's just my own personal thought. So don't, don't t take it with not even a grain of salt. But maybe, being a brother, anybody here have brothers? Okay, you might understand this. That might have required Cain to have to go to Abel and say, could I buy a sheep from you? Could I borrow an animal from your livestock to present to the Lord? That might have required humility of Cain to go to Abel and to say, I need something from you. That's one thought, maybe. Was it because he brought fruit and not a sacrifice? Was God looking for a, a bloodshed sacrifice in this moment? We know they're referred to as offerings, but ultimately, I believe it was Cain's heart. And we see that in his response and what progresses from this time of worship before the Lord. And that reminds us of where our hearts can go. We can read this and we can say, oh gosh, I would never ever be a Cain. I would never, but listen here, the Bible gives several warnings throughout the Bible, reminding us of Cain not to become like him. 
not to become like him. Listen to this. Hebrews 11.4, if you want to write this scripture address down. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. So there's another one. Faith, key word. Was his heart off? Was he doing it in faith? Was he approaching God in faith? But it was more acceptable than Cain's, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Isn't that awesome? Abel, we see just a little bit of Abel's life in the Bible, but then Hebrews tells us, though he died, he still speaks. His faith speaks on. So amazing. Hebrews 11:6 6 then says this, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Was Cain approaching God in faith? Was he seeking him, believing who he was, knowing all that he was capable of, that he was a holy God? Was he seeking him in the right way? We have to approach in faith. Jude 11 says this, Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error error and perish in Korah's rebellion. Again, Jude uses Cain as an example of do not go in the way of Cain. They went in the way of Cain. And Cain's used as this example. I love that here, Abel in Hebrew, he's used as an example of faith that he still speaks on. 1 John 3, 12 says this, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. So something in how he approached and what he brought unto the Lord here in 1 John says was evil. God looks at the heart. Amen. He looks at the heart and he knows the heart. David, King David said, I, I'm not going to take it for free. I'll buy it. I, I'm not going to go with, with something that's not acceptable. I want to present something unto the Lord. Malachi 1.8, I love this. Malachi chapter 1, verse 8 says, When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? Present that to your governor. Now, again, here is the reality. If I put people in their wrong place and take God out of his rightful place, I can find myself, again, trying to present my very best to people that truly have never done a thing for me. And then going to God with, eh, here's what's left over. Here, God, I got five minutes for you. Here's what's so awesome about our God. He'll take that five minutes, but he's going to always want more. Because he wants relationship with you and I. And that should cause us to stop and say the creator of heaven and earth wants relationship with me. And he wanted it so badly that he knew the only way to get it back and the only way to take care of sin was through his only son, Jesus. He wants relationship because he's your father. He wants relationship because he's your creator. The God who created heaven and earth, the one who is going to be responsible for the eclipse that happens tomorrow. That everybody's... There's people gathering out in the world to do worship services to the sun. Guess what? They were a week late. We just had a worship service for the sun last Sunday. So that's pretty good. We should make a T-shirt. Um, we're going to print those right away. We'll sell them in the back. Um, $19.99 comes with a free Ginzu knife. But again, he needs to be in his rightful place. And Moses was reminding them here in 17 that when you approach him with sacrifice, approach him rightly. And it grieves me to see the so-called church, which I would say is no longer the church, when you start to dismantle the word of God 
and you start to dismantle God, and you start to say, "Mm, no, that's not really who he is. This is who he is. Oh, and, and, and you've determined that. Sinful, broken man. Oh, okay, I would rather side on God, who is perfect, who, again, is creator. I would rather side with who he says he is than who you want to make him to be. And if it grieves my heart, think of how it grieves God the Father. To hear buildings and institutions that maybe at one point gathered and taught the full counsel of God now are saying, let's delete that. Let's take that away. Let's paint him in this picture. He's already painted the picture. Can't change it. You can't change him. Amen? You can't change God Almighty. Okay, we're going to wrap up real quickly here. Back in 17 of Deuteronomy, just wanted to take you over there. Interesting to see again the heart of Cain and Abel in their sacrifice, their offering unto the Lord. And real quickly, a couple other things here before we leave in 17. This is crucial. If you jump down to um, verse 6. On the evidence of two witnesses, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6. On the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses, the one Who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. We're going to see this over the next two weeks here. And what this is talking about is the uh, preceding verses. If someone uh, is found uh, in living in evilness, worshiping pagan gods, uh, one, it's to be looked into, Moses says, but then you shall not take the word of one witness. And I think this is so important because uh, this can happen in the church today. I'll get, you know, there will be times where people will come and say, hey, listen, uh, this person said this, this person did this. And then the the other person they're saying did this or whatever their accusation is or whatever took place, that person will say, no, I never did that. Okay. All right. Uh, Well, well, you've known me longer. You should agree with what I say. Uh, Yeah, but I love that what's laid out here is there can no, there can't be any, uh, opportunity for he said, she said. Well, he said, she said. And, and in those moments, here's what I've learned. When one person has an accusation against another and there's no one else that was there that saw it, that heard it, I have learned this, that if you wait on the Lord and his timing, he will always shed his light and reveal his truth. Some people don't like that answer. Well, there needs to be a decision right now. Either we need to, we need to do this or that, or there has to be action. There has to... Oh, okay, so is waiting on the Lord is not action. Actually, it is action because he's going to work and he will be faithful to show. And I love that, that Moses even brings this out, that God's desire was that there's going to be accusations within the camp of Israel. There's got to be, we're not going to go off of, we're, and m- most importantly, remember this is Old Testament times, this is, was considering stoning a person for worshiping a pagan God and going after evil things. We're not going to pick up rocks and stone anybody when one person said they did this. And there's no one else there to testify or witness to it. That's good. Would you agree? Would you agree that's wisdom? So I would encourage you, if you're looking for wisdom, look to the word of God. It's filled with his wisdom, which is so awesome. And this is what we're going to wrap up with. And I kind of talked about this in the beginning as far as going after God's plan and not running uh, from it. Moses then lays out what things will start to look like as he departs. And, and a lot of that is going to be the system put in place, starting in verse 8, of priest and judges. Look at verse 8. If, if any case arises requiring a decision between one kind of a homicide and another, one kind of a legal right and another, or kind of assault and another, any case within your towns that is too difficult for you, then you shall arise and go up to the place that the Lord your God will choose. And you shall come to the Levitical priest and to the judge who is in office in those days, and you shall consult them, and they shall declare to you the decision. Then you shall do according to what they decide uh, or declare to you from that place that the Lord will choose, and you shall be careful to do according to all that they direct you, according to the instructions that they give you, and according to the decision which they pronounce to you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside from 
uh, the verdict that they declare to you either to the right hand or to the left. So here he's saying, listen, now there's going to be this thing put in place, judges and priests. You have a matter that you can't resolve. You're going to go to the Levitical priest. You're going to go to the judge. Whatever they declare, do it. Don't veer from it because they're going to be placed by God and have God's authority upon them. I love, though, that we see again, we saw this when he started to teach them about what, where they would go to worship when they went to the promised land. And, and in verse um, 8, he reminds them that the place they're going to go to, to seek this priest and this judge, is going to be a place that God will choose. God will choose. He's saying, don't go to a place where man is chosen. Go, don't go to a shop where they say, hey, I'm a judge, I'm a priest. If it's not the place that God has chosen, if it's not the place that God has set apart, if it's not the two that God has put there, then that's not where you're going. You want to go to where God has chosen. And then he jumps ahead here in this chapter, and he tells them, this is amazing. He tells them about something they are going to want that they don't even know about yet. He tells them, you're going to eventually want a king. Check this out, verse 14, and we'll wrap up with this. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as a king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire uh, many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Moses is telling Israel, there will be a day when you go into the land that you're going to ask and want a king. You're going to ask for it. You're going to want it. And, and the reason they're going to want it is because they're going to look at all the other nations around them. And they're going to want to be like them. They're going to want to be like them. You remember the shirts when Michael Jordan was at, a, at his finest basketball I mean, amazing, right? Was he amazing or what? Pretty amazing, right? And then they came out with the shirts that said, I want to be like Mike. Remember those, that slogan, I want to be like Mike? Well, I don't even know Mike, right? I know he can slam. I would like to slam dunk like Mike. Maybe that's what my shirt should say. But I don't know Mike well enough to say I want to be like Mike. I don't know what his language is like. I don't know what he, where he stands on certain things. But, but I want to be like Jesus, Amen. Uh, and they're looking, and Moses is saying, you're going to come into the land. You're not even thinking about this right now, but you're going to come in and you're going to look around and say, I want to be like them. They have it. We should have it. But the whole, this whole time has been preparing them and telling them, you are not like them. You are set apart. You are God's chosen people. You're going to be a light. You're going to be used to represent him to all the nations around you. You're not like them, and you'll never be like them. And Moses is saying there's going to be a day where you're going to want what they have. You're going to want what they have. And here's the thing. He says, okay, you're going to get it, but it must be the one the Lord your God chooses. Must be the one the Lord your God chooses. And I love he goes through here. And in fact, it's 1 Samuel, I believe, chapter 4, where Israel then says to Samuel, we want to be like the other nations around us. Set a king over us. Find us a king. And if you remember, Samuel was broken and Samuel went to the Lord. They've rejected me, God. They don't want me. And God says, no, no, Samuel, they've rejected me. Not you. And Moses, here's the thing, God's word, here's why it's important to look to God. Moses here, through God, is laying out for them things that they're going to ask for in the future. They might be saying right now as he's talking to them, what, a king? No, we're not going to ask for a king. We've got you, Moses. We don't need anything else. We're, no, you're going to walk into the land, and you're going to look around and say, I want to be just like them, and I want a king. Now, go to the Levite priest go to the judge in the place that the Lord chooses now when you want a king make sure it's the one 
that the Lord your, the Lord your God chooses. Here's my last encouragement, ladies and gentlemen. Again, God's plan. We can't run from it because it's the best plan for us. We have to run to it. And, and we need to get to a place where we can literally just say, God, your will. God, you choose. You choose what you want for me. And the amazing thing is, that's how trustworthy our God is. You choose. Whatever you want is best. You choose. You choose. Now, when we start to grow a little bit, I can remember. I know my own kids. I know when I was a little kid, I would look at my parents and say, they know what's best. You choose. You choose. But then when I started to grow and we start to grow, we look around and go, yeah, but they have that. They got that. Maybe I don't want that. Maybe I want that. You know what? Maybe I'll choose for myself now. And the same happens with God, our Father. We get to a place where we think, you know what? It would be quicker if I just chose. It would be quicker. And, and wow, we get to a place where we have a relationship with God, but we're doing all the choosing. We're picking who we want to marry. We're choosing where we want to live. We're choosing what we want to do for our career. We're choosing where we're going to invest our money. We're choosing what we're going to bring unto him as an offering. And God's not involved in anything except that I just checked him off and God's good to go. And I still will check in every once in a while. But you know what? I'm good choosing. We need to be in a place where we can say, God, you choose. You choose, God. God, if you want me single for another 20 years, I will wait in you. God, if you want me to be married next month, you choose. That would be a little fast, but you choose. If any of you come and say, God told me to be married, and then you show up a month later with, you know, we need to be married. And I'd say, let's, let's maybe pray a little bit. Let's check it out. Wait on the Lord. But we have to be in the place where we can say, you choose. Your will, not mine. And let's be thankful this morning that our Savior said those words to his Father before he went to the cross. Your will, not mine. If there's any other way this could pass, but if not, your will, not mine. See, that tells me I have a God that will listen to my heart. He will be okay with me coming and saying, God, if there's any way this could pass, if there's any way this storm could go away, if there's any way, Lord, that this could be quicker or easier, and there's times he might say, okay, I'm going to come, I'm going to meet you in that way. But I've got to be willing to say your will. You choose. You choose. And amazing, I love this. The king is then told, they're, they're told some things about the king. If he goes after a lot of women, you're in trouble. If you see your king start acquiring many horses, you're in trouble. If you see your king starting to acquire gold and, and wealth, you're in trouble. Because it's all going to pull him away from me. Then he goes on to say that your king, the one whom the Lord will choose, he should be one that is writing down the law of the Lord and reading it day and night. If he doesn't do that, you're going to be in trouble. Today, I would say most of our kings, most of our rulers have taken too many wives, taken too much gold, and we're in trouble. But you know what? We're going to be okay because we have the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Amen? Lord of Lords. Let's stand and let's pray. God, we thank you this morning that your choice for us your will for us is best. And as we look at Israel and we see them in this place where they've wandered for so many years, getting ready to enter into the promised land and being reminded of what they're to bring unto you, what they're to sacrifice unto you, a holy God. And then being told of something that they may not even have been aware of, something that in the future they would want and ask for. And again, this challenge to them. You want what the Lord, you want who the Lord chooses. You want to go to the place that the Lord has chosen. And God, we would ask that we would be there in our lives 
where we truly would be content in saying, you choose. God, your way. God, your timing. God, your plan. God, your will be done. And God, we are so grateful and thankful that even when we go ahead of you and choose our way, you're right there to forgive us. You're right there to bring us back to what you have for us, Lord, when we see it wasn't the best. God, we want what you want. Help us again get to that place where we could let go and fully trust your choice for us. Really, there's no question of if it's even a matter of trust when we think about your choice with sending your son to die for us. You did all that work for us. So help us trust you, Jesus. Help our lives be a living sacrifice this week for you, Jesus. Help us work not unto man, but unto you. And may our words and our actions, our thoughts, and our deeds this week bring you glory, Jesus. We love you and we praise you. And we again thank you that the tomb is still empty. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.